Oh, I don't cook. Tough. Too bad. I do not cook. I hate to cook. Cooking is boring and it is stupid. Flies come to my kitchen. They have to brown bag it. I have no... The last time my husband had a hot meal, the house was on fire. I could... You know what? Because cooking is stupid and cleaning... I... Can, can we talk about cleaning? Cle I, 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 I hate to clean. And do you clean your house? No, I'm so glad. Do you have a house? Yeah, well, actually, you're like an idiot. I don't clean my house because I, I have an apartment. Uh -huh. but, uh, my, my kitchen is so dirty. My mice wear spikes. I mean, uh, yes. On August 28, 2014, Joan Rivers, the groundbreaking comedian best known for her raspy voice and razor-sharp wit that landed her countless hosting roles on television and made her a legend of the stand-up scene, stepped into an outpatient clinic in Manhattan called Yorkville Endoscopy for a routine procedure. Rivers had been suffering from a sore throat, hoarse voice, and strained vocal cords, perhaps not an unexpected set of health maladies when you consider the sheer volume of talking she did managing her busy schedule of hosting gigs. The procedure was supposed to be quick and painless, in by 9 a.m. and out by noon. The comedian was certainly no stranger to more involved medical procedures, including various cosmetic surgeries like a nose job in college, an eye lift in the 60s, and various tummy tucks and other procedures over the years. Rather than hiding from the press or lying about them through publicists, Rivers openly talked about going under the knife and gleefully folded mentions of them in her comedic routines with quips like, I've had so much plastic surgery, when I die, they'll donate my body to Tupperware. In typical Rivers fashion, she leaned into the jokes and whispers behind her back about her shifting appearance from the plastic surgeries, beating other comedians to the punch by taking swipes at herself and never becoming one of those thin-skinned comedians who can dish it out but not take it. And because comedy essentially caught up to her by the new millennium, Joan Rivers was enjoying a late-life career renaissance as a living legend, feted and revered by the most popular comedians of the new era like Sarah Silverman, Whitney Cummings, and Amy Schumer, and never relegated to a has-been like many of her contemporaries, who had either passed away or seemed woefully outdated and quaint by the 2010s. She was truly a pioneer who shook up and modernized comedy, transforming the art from its modest Borscht Belt origins with corny one-liners and puns into the more vibrant, edgy, and personal style popularized by people like Lenny Bruce. But unlike Bruce, Rivers lived long enough to reap the praise and rewards of her innovations. Much of her renewed popularity was fueled by a documentary called Joan Rivers, A Piece of Work, that premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in January 2010, chronicling the comedian's life and offering an honest appraisal of her magnificent career. It was a critical success and opened new opportunities for the then 76-year-old who started co-hosting Fashion Police on the E! Network that same year and ran for more than 286 episodes, largely defining her legacy to many young viewers who were introduced to her no-holds-bar style of poking fun at celebrities and their outfits that fit in perfectly with the era of Perez Hilton and other gossip bloggers. She was the Simon Cowell of the panel, offering her acerbic takes as a counterbalance to the more red-carpet fawning of her co-hosts like Juliana Rancic and George Katsiopoulos. Joan was clearly the breakout star of the show and parlayed its success into cameos on other shows, including playing herself in an episode of Louis C.K.'s critically acclaimed show Louis, a reality show with her daughter called Joan and Melissa, Joan Knows Best, a cameo on The Simpsons, and even a Super Bowl commercial for GoDaddy in 2011. For so long, Rivers had been somewhat marginalized by comedy's Old Boys Network, filling in for Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show, but watching other less talented men like Chevy Chase and Magic Johnson get shot after shot with late night shows while she toiled away on the sidelines. But now she was getting her chance in the spotlight and absolutely relishing it. And even in her ninth decade of life, Rivers didn't appear to be slowing down. The procedure was supposed to be just a quick tune-up to heal her vocal cords which were obviously critical to her iconic, raspy New York accent. Her personal throat doctor, Dr. Gwen Corvin, was on hand, but the procedure was supposed to be handled that day by the medical director of the clinic named Dr. Lawrence Cohen. During the procedure, Dr. Cohen found a polyp near Rivers' vocal cords during the endoscopy and then decided to allow Dr. Corvin to remove a portion of the polyp to perform a biopsy. But when Dr. Corvin attempted to do so, things took a sudden turn for the worse, and Rivers went into cardiac arrest. She was quickly transferred to Mount Sinai Hospital in East Harlem, where she was immediately put on life support in a medically induced coma. One week later, on September 4th, 2014, just 10 years ago, she was gone. Joan Rivers was 81 years old. I'm Derek Kaufman. I'm Jason Beckerman. And this is Last Days, Joan Rivers.
News of Joan Rivers' death spread immediately throughout the comedy world and beyond, with comedians posting tributes to the icon and expressing shock over the circumstances of her sudden passing. Her intergenerational appeal in the comedy world was immediately evident, as Rivers drew praise from her contemporaries, younger comedians, and everyone in between. Older generations, of course, mourn the loss of Rivers. Comedic icon Carol Burnett marveled at Rivers' indefatigable spirit and packed touring schedule late into her career, calling Rivers, quote, the poster child for the Energizer Bunny. Stand-up legend Don Rickles said, quote, working with her and enjoying the fun times of life with her was special. Even former First Lady Nancy Reagan said Rivers was, quote, one of the funniest people I ever knew. As cutting as she could be with her barbs, praise for Rivers was universal. Future President Donald Trump tweeted that Rivers, quote, was an amazing woman and a great friend, while then President Barack Obama sent a letter to Joan's daughter Melissa in which she wrote, quote, not only did she make us laugh, she made us think. Countless younger comedians weighed in. Amy Schumer called Rivers the bravest female comedian during the 2014 Glamour magazine Woman of the Year ceremony. Seth Meyers, once the head writer for Saturday Night Live and no stranger to great comedic minds, said, quote, I have not sat next to anyone who told more jokes faster than Joan Rivers did when she was here. Even some of the greatest comedic minds of their generation revered Rivers. Louis C.K. released a statement saying, quote, I looked up to her. I learned from her. I loved her. I liked her. And I already miss her very much. It really fucking sucks that she had to die all of a sudden. Chris Rock perhaps summed it up best, calling her, quote, the hippest comedian from the time she started to the day she died. And perhaps the ultimate tribute to Rivers came on Saturday Night Live in October 2014 when Sarah Silverman hosted and delivered a loving sketch featuring her impression of Rivers as MC of a roast in heaven. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, heaven. Are you serious? Me in heaven. I guess I should be here. I'm practically a virgin. The last time someone was inside me, it was Melissa. Amazing. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. My old friend Richard Pryor's here. I can't believe it. <laughs> now, this lady don't hold back for nothing. You know what I'm saying, yo? <laughs> Richard, you could never keep it in your pants. Hey, man. I don't want to say Richard fooled around, but the longest relationship he ever had was with multiple sclerosis. <laughs> <laughs> A memorial service was held at Temple Emmanuel in Manhattan on September 7th, 2014. In her 2012 book, I Hate Everyone, Starting With Me, Rivers had joked that she wanted a huge funeral that was Hollywood all the way. And instead of a rabbi speaking, she wanted, quote, Meryl Streep crying in five different accents and a wind machine so that even in my casket, my hair is blowing just like Beyonce's. The service was attended by 1,500 people, including many celebrities such as Whoopi Goldberg, Barbara Walters, Louis C.K., Diane Sawyer, Joy Behar, Rosie O'Donnell, Bernadette Peters, Matthew Broderick, and Sarah Jessica Parker. Hugh Jackman sang, Quiet, Please, There's a Lady on Stage and radio shock jock Howard Stern gave the eulogy, calling Rivers brassy in public and classy in private, a pioneer for comics everywhere who fought the stereotypes that women can't be funny. Howard would later talk about the tremendous responsibility he felt with delivering the eulogy for such an icon, noting that Melissa put him at ease when she gave the green light for a vagina joke about her mom to lighten the mood. I was really touched by all You were that. amazing. Thank you. I was, you know, I, when you called me, I so wanted to say no, only because I did love Joan so much, but I felt this was such a responsibility, and I didn't want to screw it up for you, you know? I said, oh, if I get up there and mess this up... Um, you were perfect. Well, that's why I came to you beforehand, because people said, you know, the vagina stuff was a little strong for a funeral. I said, well, I did go to Melissa at the funeral and say, do you want me to do this? Yeah. And you were okay with it. And it's the line that everybody... It set the tone. Joan's cremated remains were eventually scattered in Wyoming. Before we get into the circumstances of her death, which were very, very strange and very controversial, I did want to lay out all of the the sort of people who showed up to her funeral and absolutely adored Joan Rivers because it was across the spectrum. She was truly an icon amongst icons. I mean, when you have Louis C.K. singing your praises and Howard Stern and old comedians and new comedians, there's just no one like Joan Rivers. And I think I wanted to lay that out because the younger generation just knows her as fashion police. She was poking fun yeah. at Kardashians and people on the red carpet, but she was so much more than that. The thing, the thing that she is to me is, is the, the spanner of generations, right? Comedy has changed a lot. You, you mentioned the Borscht Belt. Comedy really is a World War II, a post-World War II convention. There was comedy before that, but it was really hacky and sort of Bob Hopey and things sure, like that. Sure, the take my wife please right. guys, Henny exactly. Youngman and exactly. so forth. And it started after World War II, like so many other things in American culture, began to get its sea legs 
And, you know, shortly thereafter, there's Joan Rivers. And she's a woman on an, and it's an all male spectacle. There are no women in comedy. You finally get sort of the laughing women that are supporting men. And that's the role that Joan Rivers played for so long, to your point, you know, filling in for Carson throughout the 70s and more into the 80s, really. But she was always kind of the person that was behind those guys. Yeah. But then she breaks out and she is the transition to this generation of comedians. Still a field that's dominated by men mostly, but there are women who are absolute superstars on the same footing as men. And they all, and to the point that you're making with all these great quotations by so many people, all of the famous, especially the women of today, stand on the shoulders of Joan Rivers. Without them, they don't exist in the in the same in the same light. And I know that sounds sort of old manish for me to say, but I really believe that it's true. I think you're exactly right. We'll get into her legacy later, but we've got to talk about the circumstances of Joan Rivers' death because this podcast is obviously called Last Days, and none is stranger than what happened to Joan Rivers. How this routine throat procedure ended in tragedy became actually the focus of an investigation by the state and federal health departments and later the subject of a medical malpractice suit filed by her surviving daughter, Melissa Rivers. The lawsuit was, of course, expected. Melissa was devastated by the loss of her mother. She's heard here describing her last moments. We knew it was going to take some time, and I got into the bed with her and held her. We were all there, and we're all standing there, and I'm holding her, and we're all chatting and waiting. And finally, the doctor says, honestly, you guys need to leave the room for a little while because very often people won't allow themselves to start to let go if everyone's in the room. Really? The, the palliative care doctor. Wow. So we all took a little bit of a break for a second and, and then about an hour after that, and she, she passed. But she was especially upset that it seemed like her mother's death was avoidable. On November 10th, 2014, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services released a report highlighting numerous mistakes and violations made by Yorkville Endoscopy, where she had the procedure. First, the agency found that the doctor who performed the laryngoscopy procedure, Joan's personal doctor, Dr. Gwen Corvin, was not a member of the medical staff at the clinic, and thus her involvement was not in accordance with the facility's bylaws and procedures. Just because you're a doctor doesn't mean you can perform procedures at any facility. The report also mentions that the particular biopsy procedure, which seems to have been done spur of the moment when the initial scope identified these polyps on her throat, was not authorized by the informed consent forms at the clinic, which only related to the scheduled procedure itself. Second, the report notes that the physicians on hand failed to identify deteriorating vital signs and provide timely intervention during the procedure, including Joan's plummeting oxygen saturation and blood pressure before she went into full cardiac arrest. So there were these warning signs that were going on while they're having this routine procedure. This is a woman who is of an advanced age. They should have been monitoring her vitals very closely and apparently weren't. Third, there was a finding that Joan's weight was not recorded as part of the pre-assessment of her condition prior to sedation with propofol for the procedure. Body weight, of course, Jason, is a critical component of the safe use of anesthetics. And the record showed that a total dose of 300 milligrams of propofol was administered to Joan during the procedure, Although a staff member said that was an error and that was a sort of a typo and only 120 milligrams were actually given to her. Fourth, the report also notes that one of the physicians took pictures of Rivers on his cell phone while she was under sedation, which didn't necessarily harm Joan, but shows a total lack of professionalism in the environment and a possible violation of her medical privacy. So, so all this icky stuff all, all around. All these little things that we're seeing, none of them in and of themselves necessarily were fatal, but they, to your point, they just showed the lack of professionalism. I mean, you've got a doctor there who's not licensed to do this particular procedure. You've got a the, the failure to check her weight, the, the misstep or, or the misrecording of the amount of propofol, and then you've got these photographs being taken. This is just sort of like a bunch of we're wild westing it in this in this uh, in the surgical center it makes you think maybe it happens a lot but this time a woman died and you can imagine the scene i mean she had her personal doctor with her people develop close personal relationships yeah. with their doctors who showing it to, to the procedure is okay in and of itself as you said it was just the confluence of all these things it wasn't it didn't seem like it was being taken seriously it right. seemed like a routine procedure and they're like hey you're in there let me get a, a little piece of the biopsy uh, while we're in her throat and her vitals were plummeting yeah. and no one was noticing you just sort of get it you got the you find the polyp and it's like well we don't want to put her 
under again to remove these things. So let's just do it. But that's not the way it works, right? You've, you've got you've got to get the patient's informed consent before doing these things, which they didn't do. So obviously, a, a lot of really big issues here. And Derek, the findings of the health department combined with the medical examiner's conclusion that Rivers died from a lack of oxygen to her brain after she stopped breathing and went into cardiac arrest inevitably became the subject of a malpractice lawsuit filed against Yorkville Endoscopy and her physicians by Melissa Rivers in January of 2015. Melissa has obviously been really vocal about, was from the beginning about her displeasure about what happened to her mom, not just obviously the fact she died, but really the- They were incredibly horrible, close as well. Yeah, they were incredibly close, just the horrible treatment. And so she puts this into a lawsuit and she says, quote, to put it mildly, we are not just disappointed by the acts and omissions leading to the death of Joan Rivers, but we are outraged by the lack of care and concern for Miss Rivers on the part of her treating physicians in the endoscopy center where the treatment was rendered. Had the doctors acted as physicians for Joan Rivers instead of groupies, Joan Rivers would have been doing fashion police last week. Melissa said, what ultimately guided me was my unwavering belief that no family should ever go through what my mother, Cooper, and I have been through. It is my goal to make sure that this kind of horrific medical treatment never happens to anyone again. The notes from the primary anesthesiologist proved critical to the case. The doctor noted that he sensed something was amiss during the procedure when he noticed Joan's vocal cords were extremely swollen and could seize up, causing an airway blockage. Rather than ordering a crash cart to administer a drug to relax the muscles and insert a breathing tube, the doctor said his comments were dismissed as, quote, paranoid concerns. He described several chaotic and critical minutes passing without appropriate emergency techniques being deployed before Rivers went into cardiac arrest. Although she was resuscitated and placed on life support, she never recovered. After more than a year of litigation, the lawsuit eventually settled for an undisclosed amount. Melissa said she was happy with the result, ensuring, quote, that those culpable for her death have accepted responsibility for their actions quickly and without equivocation. She also focused on the broader picture, hoping her lawsuit would ensure that clinics like Yorkville Endoscopy operate under the same minimum safety standards as hospitals. Let's go ahead and take a quick break and more on the legacy of Joan Rivers when we come back. This episode is brought to you by Air Doctor. This is a product that I truly believe in. You know, air purification in my house. I have two young kids. It's something I really believe in. I have these throughout my house. And you know, Americans take about 20,000 breaths a day and spend an average of 90% of their time indoors. You know, the indoor air we breathe can be up to 100 times more polluted than outdoor air, according to the EPA. Indoor air pollutants can cause respiratory symptoms like sneezing, congestion, scratchy throat, and even more serious health problems like lung and heart disease. So what's the solution to all this? Introducing Air Doctor, the air purifier that filters out 99.99% of dangerous contaminants so your lungs don't have to. This includes allergens, pollen, pet dander, dust mites, mold spores, and even bacteria and viruses. Air Doctor comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you don't love it, just send it back for a refund minus shipping. Head to airdoctorpro.com and use promo code LAST and you'll receive up to $300 off air purifiers. Exclusive to podcast customers, you'll also receive a free three-year warranty on any unit, which is an additional $84 value. Lock this special offer by going to airdoctorpro.com. That's A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R-P-R-O.com and use promo code LAST. The word trailblazer is thrown around very loosely in the comedy world, but few of the figures in the comedy world who get the label can withstand a close examination of history. Richard Pryor is often credited with modernizing stand-up comedy, but Lenny Bruce and Red Fox were clear predecessors upon whom he built his style. Andrew Dice Clay seemed to usher in a new era of comedy rock stars filling stadiums and arenas, but students of comedy remember a time before the Dice Man when Steve Martin was performing to enormous crowds and stadiums and attracting an almost cultish following. But what Joan Rivers did for female comedians in the 1960s was, in the truest sense of the word, pioneering. To be clear, she certainly wasn't alone. She had predecessors like Moms Mabley and Sophie Tucker, who was famous for her body style and lines like, I know clean stories, I don't make money with them, but I know them. And there were zany performers like Carol Burnett and Phyllis Diller, but their brand of sketch comedy and exaggerated stage personas was a bit different than true stand-up comedy. But in terms of setting the mold for several generations of future female stand-ups from Elaine Boozler to Roseanne Barr to Sarah Silverman to Amy Schumer, nobody comes close to Joan Rivers. Rivers cut her teeth in the early 60s, performing in various comedy clubs in Greenwich Village, befriending some of the rising stars in the scene like Woody Allen and George Carlin. Her first big break would come with an appearance on The Tonight Show, which was then hosted by Jack Parr, to give you a sense of how long ago this was. 
But Joan would later say the appearance actually slowed down her progress after Parr thought she lied about her background. First television appearance, I was brought up by an agent to the Jack Parr show. And um, I thought it went very well because I was then in office temporary. So I was telling him I used to steal stamps and sell them for half price, which is all true. And I told him these stories. I said, I'm from Larchmont. My dad's a doctor. And uh, what was my joke? Oh, he spent two years in uh, medical school, two years in Tijuana. You know, his first words are, does that look right to you, nurse? And she always says, it doesn't matter, doctor. And uh, the next day, a man named Bob Shanks brought me up. The next day uh, at the meeting, they said, gee, that girl was funny to Parr. And Parr said, she was a liar. A doctor's daughter doesn't steal stamps. And he took a pencil and put it through my name. But Rivers stuck with it, and when Johnny Carson took over The Tonight Show, he gave Joan another shot and famously told her, you're going to be a star. And from there, Derek, her career absolutely took off. In addition to her frequent spots on Carson's Tonight Show, she was a regular on the talk show circuit, performing sets on The Ed Sullivan Show, The Mike Douglas Show, and The Dick Cavett Show. And Joan was proving herself to be an asset not only on stage, but also in the writer's room. In 1973, she co-wrote a made-for-TV movie called The Girl Most Likely 2, which was a black comedy starring Stalker Channing as an ugly duckling who becomes beautiful after plastic surgery and takes revenge on people who previously mistreated her. That negligee as I thought you would. Thank you, Herman. It's a lovely gift. And you, you kept the price tag on like I asked you to. That way, if we're careful, I can return it on Monday. Come here, darling. For obvious reasons, the movie has become a bit of a cult classic, echoing so many of the themes from Joan's real-life preoccupation with plastic surgery. By the 1980s, Rivers was already an institution, hosting SNL, performing in Carnegie Hall, and releasing her best-selling comedy album, What Becomes a Semi-Legend Most, which actually reached number 200 on the Billboard 200 album chart and was nominated for a Grammy for Best Comedy Album. It also appeared like Johnny Carson was finally grooming her to potentially replace him establishing Rivers as his first permanent guest host. But it all came to a crashing halt with her decision to launch a rival talk show with the upstart Fox Television Network in 1986. Rivers would become the first woman to have her own late-night show on a major network, but the time slot at 11 p.m. made it a direct competitor with The Tonight Show. Carson was apparently livid when he heard about it from Fox rather than Rivers herself. Rivers said Carson took it as a complete betrayal and never spoke to her again. The wound was so deep that Carson's next two successors, Jay Leno and Conan O'Brien, both refused to have Rivers on the show out of respect for Carson. She finally made an appearance just months before her death in February 2014 when Jimmy Fallon took the reins of the show. This was a big deal at the time. Do you remember the late night uh, Johnny Carson when he was aging, who was going to take over yeah. for him was, you know, fodder for, for the news. And she was really in the running because she was so talented as that in that role of permanent guest host that everyone thought he was yeah. passing the torch to Joan Rivers. And he developed, by all accounts, a very close friendship with her. He was like, you're my heir apparent. I helped made, make you and launch you into this world, and I'm going to want to hand this over to you. So the betrayal, when you hear the stories of her taking the gig with Fox, were deep. It's so deep that how, how revered Johnny Carson was, Conan O'Brien and Jay Leno refused to have her on the show. It, it, it sort of lost to history, the story, because we all remember that it was going to be Dave or Jay, right? Letterman or Leno, and eventually becomes Leno. And there's been, you know, television shows written about sure. that feud and, and how their relationship suffered. And then Leno gets it and Dave has been dismayed. It was dismayed ever since and the whole thing. The story of Joan, I was unaware prior to this that that she had been so uh, that Carson was so upset that she took that that Fox gig. I remember the Fox gig. I remember it really being terrible. Yeah, I don't think didn't anybody work. Really watched it. Um, Fox, to your point, it, it was an upstart. Nobody really knew what it was. To me, it was like a place you went for local news, and then all of a sudden, it's it's given to it's given to Leno, and Letterman gets his own show, and then. Joan is sort of in the wilderness for some time before making, obviously, the, the, the late life comeback that is she's so famous for. She really was. As you said, the late show starring Joan Rivers on Fox was short lived. It ran from just October 1986 until May 1987, and it doesn't have a sort of great legacy. On top of being a professional failure, her husband, Edgar Rosenberg, a producer of the show, died from suicide just months later in August 1987. And Rivers, in fact, blamed the tragedy on this humiliating period uh, during the Fox show. 
Perhaps the brightest moment of the 80s came in the form of some voice work in the Mel Brooks classic Spaceballs. Rivers played Dot Matrix, a droid loosely based on C-3PO from the Star Wars franchise, and she brilliantly lampooned her persona, stealing nearly every scene she was in. Abandon ship! Abandon ship! Women and mugs first! Well, I'm none of that, mister. How far did he get? What did he touch? What did he touch? Nothing happened. What the hell was that noise? That was my virgin alarm. It's programmed to go off before you do. You get back to bed, miss. And as for you, sex fiend. All right, all right. Let's all just get some sleep. We got to get moving before dawn. Why so early? Personal favorite of mine, Spaceballs. Whenever I have a chance to bring it up, when we talked about John Candy, I bring up Spaceballs. She's phenomenal in it. And it's just voice work. You know, it's not actually John Rivers, but the droid looks just like John Do Rivers. Do kids watch Spaceballs today? I hope so. Because to me, it's it's <laughs> in terms of parody movies. Wow. Do you watch Spaceballs? No. Branson? Anybody? Any? Yeah, you see seen Spaceballs. There you go. I adore Spaceballs. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. So anyway, her career up to this point was more than enough to firmly establish her as a legend of the comedy scene. But Joan Rivers had one last trick up her sleeve and completely reinvented her career one last time. In 1994, Joan and Melissa hosted their first pre-award show for E! in the lead up to the Golden Globe Awards and proceeded to revolutionize red carpet treatment, turning it into a space to showcase designers, Think of Joan's famous words, who are you wearing, question on the red carpet, as well as a place for celebrity interactions and brief interviews. And this would become River's stock and trade for the remainder of her career and opened up a raft of new opportunities in the entertainment space, including stints on game shows like Big Brother, Celebrity Hijack, and Celebrity Apprentice, which she ended up winning over Annie Duke in 2009. And in 2010, she launched Fashion Police, as we've mentioned before on E! And it was a permanent vehicle to showcase her brand of no-holds-barred celebrity snark and fashion talk without waiting around for award season to even happen. Next up, we've got Snooki. She also tweeted. What can I say? Snooki's pussy is exhausting. (laughs) (laughs) Moral dilemma. If you touch Snooki's pussy when she's passed out, is that a crime? But just as she usually does it. <laughs> yes, Snooki's pussy just winked at you, but don't be. F- <laughs> Her pussy winks at everybody. <laughs> And the show would run up until her death, airing her last episode just two days before she went to the clinic. And Jason, y- you know, her brand of comedy is sort of resonant with us because a lot of what TMZ does is kind of snark about celebrities. And Joan was right there running alongside yeah. us. You know, she would poke fun at the Kardashians, yeah. poke fun at Justin Bieber. All of it seems very vibrant and fresh, even when you watch those clips today, because she was just always very much ahead of the curve. 100%. She and David Spade, I often think about, you know, his, him doing the Hollywood Minute. It was the same kind of thing that, you know, we built, well, not we, but you and I have been part of this this building of this enterprise. And it's largely based on things that people like Joan Rivers were doing before us. Yeah. You know, a big piece of Joan Rivers' legacy will always be bound up with her guest stints and countless appearances on late night talk shows. She was simply one of the best guests you could book. Fearless, reliably hilarious, quick on her feet, unafraid of a little controversy to generate headlines, and a comedian's comedian in the truest sense of the word. While many big name guests can be dreadfully boring or moody or aloof, Joan would always deliver just rarely had an off night and would always bring the kind of energy that late night talk show hosts need to turn in a quality show night after night. She knew the grind and was always game. And one of her biggest fans in late night television was David Letterman, who famously didn't suffer fools and brought an offbeat energy to his own late night show for decades, creating memorable moments with everyone from Andy Kaufman to Farrah Fawcett to Joaquin Phoenix. He very rarely got sentimental or starstruck by celebrities. But he also came from the stand-up world and had a tremendous sense of the history of his art form, which is what made his touching tribute to Joan Rivers after her passing especially stand out to me. And so I wanted to give David Letterman the final word. She was indefatigable. Uh, She would be on this show, uh, she would be on all of the shows, and she would work about 300 dates a year. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of travel. And she would go out, and she was 81 years old out doing it, and uh, funny uh, today as she was when she first got into show business, and talk about guts. She would come out here and sit in this chair and say some things that were Uh unbelievable. Just where you would have to swallow pretty hard and twice 
but it was hilarious and, and she stood behind her jokes and to my knowledge would, would say these things and never apologize because she always felt, hey, I'm a comedian, these are jokes, there are no victimless jokes and she was harder on herself than anybody really. She would tell these god awful jokes about herself. So she felt like, look, if I'm gonna tell them about myself, then there are some other people out there that grow up, these are just jokes.